being here, there's a lot of great content here, so I appreciate you guys taking the time to enjoy uh, the talk. Um, my name is Mike Abbott, I'm a quality engineer, but I, I work on the CoreOS project right now. Uh, and the reason I decided to do this talk because uh, since joining Red Hat about four years ago, I've been a part of some really great, really great team, and uh, I, I found the strength in the team is basically built on the relationships of the team members. So I'm here to talk about how you can build those relationships to uh, have a really high functioning team. Uh, first, I some bad news though. I'm not an expert in this. This is not novel advice or ideas. You can probably come up with yourself with some research and business management practices and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm not going to guarantee that this is going to work for you and your team. Team dynamics are incredibly complex and you have to figure out what's going to work best for you. Oops. Good side though, I've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, I've seen a lot of good, bad, and great teams. Uh, thankfully, you have got that all great. Uh, and before I was a software, uh, developed software, I had a, I guess, technology degree, so I have a little bit of background on this. The majority of this talk is going to be focused around building a team in an agile framework, in an agile uh, team. Building teams that use the agile methodology. Uh, I'll talk about why I think old way of doing things, the waterfall method, uh, isn't as effective, and uh, how Agile solves some of these problems, and how you can uh, apply the uh, Basil's hierarchy of needs to an Agile team uh, to, to grow it, to be even stronger. So this is our representation of the uh, waterfall method. Uh, the way I see this is that you have individual silos of each stage of software development with a single output that goes to one way. Uh, there's no uh, representation of feedback to other teams previous stage of each model, and that has uh, a lot of problems involved. Uh, for example, the silos tend to breed poor communication. Uh, when you have one stage just giving the output to the next stage, they're not really, they're not really worried about communicating with the, the people who are receiving the, the, in, the output of your state, uh, state of software development, whether it's design or architecture or development. Um, and there's no, not a lot of collaboration because everyone's focused on just their one output. They don't really care about uh, what happens the next time, uh, for the next stage. Uh, there's also a really poor amount of for accountability. Uh, typically, we see this in a development QE uh, interaction where uh, development finishes their code, they throw a ball to keep the QE, and QE gets it and says, you know, this doesn't build, or this crashes, and core dumps. Uh, and then you have to restart the process and, and start over. I also found that it's not really conducive to feedback or improvement. Most people just want to get through their stage uh, and then wash their hands of the work and move on to the next, next thing. So they're not taking the time to think about what went wrong in, in the, this particular, uh, in that stage, or that, uh, that particular product, uh, and they don't really want to improve because the, the improvement is hard. And when the interactions do happen between the teams, they can be stressful. It's usually around uh, a customer that has a problem that where everything's on fire, you've got dev and QE involved, sales involved, management's involved, high stress, everyone wants to find a solution, and no one's going to be acting on their best behavior. So this is where Agile comes in. By default, it, it's, it uh, encourages inclusivity and collaboration uh, on your team. So I'm part of an, uh, an Agile team at Red Hat, I'm QE, my teammates are development, we have support people coming in to help out, documentation people in to come out, um, even marketing comes in occasionally talk to talk to us, so we already have this inclusive, collaborative uh, model to work for. And Agile also require, uh, relies on frequent communication work. Uh, we have regular stand-ups, uh, we have regular uh, retrospectives where we get to talk about what worked and what didn't work, uh, and that leads us to the ability to continuously improve and evolve. So at these retrospectives, we can talk about what worked and what didn't work, and then try ideas to make the process better for our team. Uh, and finally, we have, since we're all in this cohesive team, we have the shared accountability about when we succeed and when we fail. If something doesn't work coming out of our uh, team, it's not us pointing at one person or another, it's the whole team that owns that problem that, uh, and that success. So this is where we can start to apply massive hierarchy. So, Maslow's hierarchy of needs was introduced by Abraham Maslow in 1943. It's a model for uh, human growth, basically. Uh, and the model states that you can't start to think about the higher order needs 
unless you uh, 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 met your, your lower level needs. So in software development, hopefully all of us have basic needs met. We have food, water, and warmth, security and safety of our roof over our heads. And that allows us to now think about the next order needs. And when talking about um, software development on teams, I think we can, we're going to focus on is the middle two uh, uh, levels, the psychological needs of belongingness and esteem. I'll scratch the surface of self-actualization, but that's a really broad topic that I don't think we can uh, limit to just uh, working on a team and, and, uh, at work. So belongingness, defined as intimate relationships with friends and hopefully co-workers. Uh, it's human nature for us to be, want to be part of a group. Uh, you look at evolutionary, we evolved from animals that form troops, that then early humans form tribes, and then we form towns and cities. And, you know, we have a whole civilization. Or if you take it down to a smaller level, you know, in the workplace, we're a part of a small group, we want to belong, we want to feel like we are part of the team. Um, and I think the best way to do that is to strengthen uh, the relationship over time. These, uh, these relationships are the, the backbone of your team. If you don't have uh, a strong relationship with your team members, you're not going to be able to have the open, uh, the open and honest communication that I, that I talk about here. Um, or the trust to uh, talk to your those team members openly without fear of being uh, uh, thought negatively. So how do we build relationships? In my opinion, the best, the best way to do this is through in-person interactions. Now, this isn't ideal for uh, highly distributed teams, so you can approximate this with video calls. Uh, you don't want to forget those remote team members when you're all working on distributed, distributed teams because they can easily feel like they're not part of the team if they're not included in regular conversations. So it's important to keep that, that those lines of communication open. Uh, I think interact, these in-person interactions can and should happen during and after work hours. So during work hours, that's kind of obvious. You have to talk to everybody that's on the team. But after work hours, that's a chance where you can share a beer, have a meal, talk about one another, get to know your team members, and that level of familiarity with your team members is going to breed that, that trust and that support within your, your team. Um, and that just is going to benefit the team as a whole as you move forward through the software development process. I like to say you should, if you have a large team that's distributed, um, you should aim to get one in-person meeting per year. Um, if I had all the money in the world, I'd be doing it like every quarter with my team, but that's just not feasible all the time. So to, cut, to recap, Interaction via text is okay. Video, you're getting better. In person, wow, and after hours interaction is <laughs> So, this is an idea I have uh, in terms of belongingness. Uh, the idea is of confidence and champions. Uh, when, you're, when you're building a team, you and, or you're new to a team, even, you may not feel uh, comfortable enough to share all your controversial ideas or comments with the group at large. So, I find it helps to find someone on the team that you can trust singularly to say, well, I've got this idea, or I've got this opinion, but I'm not sure how the group's going to react to it. What do you think? And they can help you kind of shape the opinion, give you the feedback that you need to uh, engage whether you want to reach the topic with your larger team. Um, I also think that it's even better if you can find a champion on your team or external to the team. And this champion is someone uh, that will really support and encourage your work. Uh, and provide you the, the, like the moral imperative, essentially, to uh, pursue ideas that you think are interesting or you think are valuable, and uh, hopefully make you more successful as an engineer and as a person. So now we have some belongingness covered. We've built some relationships with our team. We need to talk, talk about esteem. Esteem is defined as prestige, the feeling of accomplishment. And that basically means everyone wants to feel like their contributions are important. So the best way to do that is to practice regular feedback. So feedback can take a lot of different forms, so I'll get into that right now. So the easiest way to get feedback is just through gratitude. Uh, I think as an industry, we do a really poor job of giving thanks to each other for things as simple as like, hey, did you open up a bug report for me? Hey, did you create a Jira card for me? Just these small, uh, Small, uh, small jobs, small tasks that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we often forget to say thank you to the person who did it. And I think that thank you can go a long way 
because you never know what, what kind of day that person has had, what kind of uh, problems they might be facing, and that little brightness of thanks could make a difference in their day. Uh, another form of, of feedback is celebrating achievements. So within the group, say you have a junior uh, engineer and they get their first PR emergency history. Like that's worthy of celebrating with the, within the group because they've never done that before. It was probably difficult for them. It was, it's probably a big barrier for them to overcome. That deserves some achievement. And then on the other hand, you might have somebody who was awarded a patent. That's something you might want to you know, broadcast to your organization. Hey, this engineer's got a patent. Let's talk. Let's congratulate him on the work he did there. Uh, more feedback. Uh, advice on how to improve. And this is sometimes labeled as criticism, but I think criticism has a, a negative connotation. So if you think about giving feedback on someone's uh, pull request or code, if you were to say, well, I don't like the way you did this, you should do it this way, that is going to be received negatively. Instead, if you frame it as, that way will work, but have you considered doing it this way because it's more performant or more stylistic or more efficient? Framing that advice in a positive positive way is going to build that relationship with, your, with those team members and make them more open to accepting additional feedback from you in the future. The other type of feedback that I think we need to practice is apologies. No one's perfect. We're always going to make mistakes. Sometimes you're going to submit them. You're going to merge that pull request and it's going to break everything. So give her a friend and you should take ownership of that and say you're sorry. Likewise, if you are interacting with somebody who's apologizing for a mistake. You need to accept that apology uh, respectfully as well and move on. No one wants to be remind, reminded of the mistakes they made in the past and having that held over their head as some sort of you know, bad omen. Uh, and ultimately, all this feedback has to be done respectfully. Uh, whether it's positive or negative, if you're tossing around feedback without justification, uh, it's going to lose its value and it will cause your team members to withdraw from your team and not be as uh, well integrated. So I have to throw this, up, this code up, uh, put it here, feedback is a gift. Someone smarter than me just said it to me the other day, and it, it really resonated because when you think about getting that feedback, whether it's positive or negative, uh, the positive one you can internalize to make yourself feel good about yourself for that day or that moment or whatever. The advice on improve, again, that's an opportunity for you to grow as a person, become better as a person, become a better team. Self-actualization, so this is a tricky one. Um, achieving one's full potential including creative activities. Well, full potential only talking about what you're doing at work seems to go contrary to each other. So you can't achieve self-actualization only working with a few other things. But if you have these strong, respectful relationships with your team, you no longer have to be concerned with whether your ideas or whether your opinions are going to have a negative impact on the team or be received negatively. That frees you up to kind of think of more creative solutions to problems, pursue more creative goals, uh, or even attempt activities that are outside your normal uh, job description. Uh, using myself as an example, I'm a QE engineer by, by title, by trade, um, but having joined this amazing team at Red Hat and grown together, we have these great relationships, a great respect for one another. Now I've been encouraged to pursue things like writing articles for upstream magazines, upstream blogs, public speaking is my first dev comp presentation, um, which I never thought I would do, but it's scratching an issue I didn't know I had. So, and the only, but the only reason I could do that is because, like I said, I have this team that respects me and supports me and allows me to pursue these additional goals. So, implementing the hierarchy of practice. Number one, it's going to take time and patience because relationships are built over time. You can't implement, start implementing these ideas in one week and then suddenly have a perfectly functioning team where everyone's happy or lucky and is willing to accept and give feedback. People are progressing at different paces, and during this time, uh, you're, uh, you, you can discover the strengths and weaknesses of your team and that will allow you to assign work more effectively and pair people up to uh, complement one another. So you need to have frequent interactions. Um, in the Agile or Scrum uh, methodology, we use Scrum on my team. 
we have those daily standouts where we talk about what we're working on, what we're going to work on. We have regular retrospectives where we talk about what didn't work, what did, uh, what did work in the previous sprint. And in our case, we have these open, open hours where we do once a week where we all jump on a video call and we can talk about the problems facing, uh, technical problems the team is facing, as well as a chance just to ask how the weather is, what kind of movies did they see, what you had for dinner, how are the kids, that kind of thing, like building those personal relationships, forming stronger connections with your team, and ultimately strengthening the team as a whole. Um, as I said earlier, interact uh, during and after work hours. Go grab a beer with that, that guy that you work with or that girl that you work with. Find a way to have a team dinner. Like here at DevCom, it's great. I have most of my team here. We had a team dinner yesterday. It was amazing just to be able to talk to these people, uh, not necessarily about work, but just to talk about you know, the world and what we're into and all that stuff. And then if you're in an office, uh, like I am, you have teammates that are on different floors for you to pass. Take the time to get out of your desk, go grab a coffee, go down to the guy below you or the guy girl above you, and talk to them about their day, ask them how they're doing. And just you know, have that face-to-face -face interaction, which is, I think, a really powerful, powerful way to build the relationships uh, in your team. You also need team leaders to, to <coughs> demonstrate these principles uh, in, in action. Um, and the team lead doesn't necessarily have to be uh, by title. You might have somebody on your team who is a little more charismatic, a little more energetic about, excited about uh, building these relationships between your team members. Uh, I think when you have people like that who are willing to put themselves out there and try these activities, try these practices, it will uh, demonstrate to the other team members that it's okay to kind of open yourself up a little bit, make yourself a little more vulnerable, and share more things on your team. Um, but it should be voluntary, because not everyone's going to be excited about sharing their feelings or sharing what they did last night or sharing where they go on vacation. Some people just like to sit in front of the terminal, write code, and log off into the day, and that's it. So that being said, you don't want to ex exclude those people. You want to continually give them the, uh, the opportunity to participate in these discussions, the opportunity for them to share things about themselves with the rest of the team, uh, and just get to know each other. Finally, how do you measure this? Well, any, how do you know that what you're doing with these uh, principles, with the hierarchy, is actually working? Um, well, I haven't found an objective way to measure this. Uh, if somebody has some metrics that we can point to, I'm happy to hear about that. But I think subjectively, you can consider questions uh, like this. So the set of personal questions and the set of like work, work related questions. Like, do you know more of the more than the name where somebody lives of the team? In some cases, you might not because they might not want to share that with you. That's fine. But I know I don't think, using myself as an example, I know the names of, where, the names of everybody, where they live. I know if they're married. I know if they have kids. I know if they have pets. I know what kind of music they listen to. Um, yeah, we've shared beers together. We've shared plays together. So there is a, uh, a rich relationship that we have uh, amongst our team. And like I said, that is the foundation of building trust and respect in the team. Likewise, if you have conversations about things other than work, it's easy to get together in a group and then start really talking about the technical problems you're facing with the team or the solution that you're working on or this project you're working on. Like after after it works, projects might fall into the uh, personal information you want to talk about, but I'm talking about getting to know the person. Same, same space here, shared break around the other team. I think you know, that ability is, that ability to do that is, is very powerful. So it's hard to beat yourself on the And then in the, work, in the workspace, can you have open disagreements respectfully with no hurt feelings? So this means like you have a problem facing you, there's two different solutions. How do you discuss those solutions and come out of there without having your team in shambles? It's very difficult to do on a team where you don't have the respect and trust of one another. Um, when you do have the respect and trust, you can get really heated about the solution to talk about it. And then walk out the door and say, that was a, that was a discussion, we're talking. we'll see you again you know, later on. Um, 
can you hold your team members accountable when, you, when they say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z by the end of the day, and it's really important to your deliverables, can you hold them, can you go to them and say, well, you haven't delivered this for me, what's going on? Can I, can I help you? Is there something that we can do together to uh, achieve your, your goals? And that goes into the next question. Can you, are you willing to help your team members to achieve their goals? Um, some people want to just have head down and work alone. I don't want to, I don't want to work in a group. But I think when you have uh, you know, the, a strong team, you're willing to collaborate together to try to uh, achieve goals together. And then finally, is your team ready to deliver your milestones? Um, if you recall the abstract, the, the abstract I have for this talk, I said, well, what if you have a team that has all the technical talent in the world, but they can't deliver their milestones? Well, in this hypothetical team, I would guess that they're probably not uh, a, not, not a well-rounded team in terms, of, in terms of having strong relationships. They're probably just head down trying to Solve all the problems themselves and not willing really to talk to other team members on how, how we can work together to solve the problems. With that, I'm done. We have some to each other. Uh, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, it's the beginning of the uh, beginning of the presentation. I'm Reed here on Twitter. That's probably the best way to, to get in touch with me. Thanks. Any questions?
might never do it. Some like that, and all we do is just keep saying, "Hey, you want to come join the field panel?" 